I'm in a terrible state. No, I am. I'm in a terrible, terrible state. And to be precise, I'm in the state of Alaska, which is sort of in the middle of nowhere, which is where I normally end up these days. Last time it was Mongolia, now it's Alaska. And it is an American state, as you probably know. And we've been driving for <laughs> 11 hours today, after a 24-hour journey to get here. 11 hours we've been on the road. We've met some pretty amazing people already. Hopefully we'll be introducing you to some of those people later on. Well, you're not gonna believe this. We found some people. Somebody who's not part of our trek. We just came across them. Victor and his lady were just uh, here. Victor, what are you doing out here? We're out doing a little bit of hunting and some camping, mostly looking for some black bear. Uh, it's a prime time for them right about now. Uh, hang on, what happens when you find the black bear? Uh, we plan on shooting it and then uh, go ahead and skinning it. You turn a meat into jerky or to sausage and you can tan to hide and have a bear hide on your floor or on your wall. I mean, excuse my ignorance, and I've got to be careful what I say to you because you are heavily armed, <laughs> uh, but uh, you can just shoot bear, there's no restriction on that? You have to buy a permit. It's your permit cost, $40 a year, Okay. and it enables you to get a uh, black bear, and then you can get moose, caribou, okay. sheep, uh, deer, Okay. and then if you want a, a black, or excuse me, a grizzly bear, you have to pay another $25. And what, what uh, what's the hardest one to get? Definitely a grizzly. Yeah. Uh, that one is so big that even when you shoot with a high-powered rifle, it still can charge really fast. It can uh, cover 100, you know, 100 yards in a matter of seconds. Even with a bullet in them? Even in a bullet. I mean, that's taken out of the heart and the lungs. Your first shot on, on a grizzly bear is to try to bust the shoulder. Oh, no. That way it can't run and chase you down. And, you know, to do this, you're not just a keen amateur. You're a former sole military man yourself. Yeah, ex-military. Right. And so if I've got to be careful what I say, like, you know, and with the greatest respect, sir, um, <laughs> <laughs> what do you, what do you, uh, what do you pack? Oh, gee, what is this? Hold on. It's a three to seven magnum. Hey, is um, this like this is like Dirty Harry magnum? No, oh this is, no, this is a little bit smaller. Oh. I use this one mostly for uh, journalists who bother you. As no, you're... actually, it's, it's <laughs> more of a defense weapon for for personnel for people. Um, they're just you never know who you might run out run into out here. So that's what I use this what one for. What you mean, crazy guys? Exactly. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of the state troopers though. For about a month, we're looking for a murderer who's hiding in the woods. Okay. So I carry personal protection for me and my girlfriend, Susan. Right. Okay. And then, but for bear... Oh no, this is... Oh, can you believe this? This is not... This is for real. <laughs> I have another one I carry. I've got a Swiss Army knife. How would that <laughs> get me all around it? I don't around it. work too well. Okay, hang on. What's this? This is a 30 odd 6 uh, It became famous during World War II, the caliber. Uh-huh. And this is just my... Oh! One I carry for my bear. I mean... It's nice and light, but it still can do the job. Uh -huh. And it's, it's an all-purpose caliber. It's used for sheep, deer, uh, moose, caribou. Okay. I would not try to take a, a grizzly bear with this, though. It's too small a caliber. I'd go for like a 7 millimeter Magnum. A lot more knockdown power. Or one of those Exocet missiles. Or yeah, like <laughs> exactly. Okay. But look, while you're packing that away, because I know you can't... Uh, oh, dear. <laughs> Ooh. I've never been this close to guns before. But... Uh, Tell us, Victor, about the vehicle you're on. This is a Honda quad quad bike, we call them. A, Do you call them that? It's a Honda four-wheeler. Uh, we just call them four-wheelers or ATVs, all-terrain yeah. vehicles. Um, they're, they're a must up here for Alaska if you plan to do any type of hunting. Before I invest in one of these, I used to walk everywhere. And as you can see, I mean, there's a lot of area to cover in a short amount of time. Right. You're not uh, tempted by something like a Jeep Wrangler or something like that, an open-top thing? No, no, no. no this will get me a lot of places that the Jeeps won't. 
Um, um, I hear that uh, there's a danger you can damage your wrist on these things. I was going to get one for my little boy, and somebody said, hey, you've got to be careful uh, because... It all depends on the rider. Uh, if you take caution, just like with any vehicle, whether it be a motorcycle or, or an automobile, there's always a risk involved with any type of... It just all depends on how you ride, and how you treat the machine, and you got to know your limitations. You know, if I wouldn't try to take it up some of these mountains. It just, it's not made for that, and it, it'd be more of a safety hazard to me or anybody else. And uh, what do you think of us guys going through that? That, uh, that, that was pretty impressive. Uh, I was telling her that's the first time I've ever seen vehicles back here. And I really didn't think you guys would make it. And you guys did a good job against that mud puddle. We've had a hell of a day, I tell you. We've been on the road for about, well, on the road. What a stupid thing to say. We've been off the road for about 13 hours. I think, yeah. And um, we still got about two hours to go. Back there was, uh, that annoyed me actually. Because some Austrian idiot probably wasn't following instructions. He was actually driving with the team leader in the car with him. So he must have been getting instructions first hand. And he, uh, stalled the car, it was in the river, and it looked pretty nasty at one point, and it meant that all of us, the entire convoy, had to hang around for an hour or more while his car was repaired. Unfortunately, we got mechanical backup, but if you are an off-roader and you do go out with your own vehicle, I mean, let that be a lesson to you. What the hell would you do if you did what the stupid Austrian had done, which is to dump the thing in the middle of a river, stall the engine, flood the engine with water. I mean, it took professional mechanics well over an hour to sort that out. You wouldn't be able to sort that problem out yourself if you owned a vehicle and you were in that situation. And you'd be stranded in the middle of nowhere. It's the middle of October, it's just above freezing, and we're staying in a castle on the northern coast of Scotland. And that's a pretty strange place for Alfa Romeo to be launching their new GTV and Spider soft top options. Now if these cars weren't sexy enough already, they've just been given a potent injection of the mechanical version of Viagra. There's a scorching new V6 3 litre engine in the GTV, and for this model, the Spider, they've tweaked and tuned the engine to give it even more power. Let's just give it a try. Just take a look at that. No, no, not that, this. Because they've given the Spider a little bit of a makeover. To start with, we've got new alloy wheels. There's kick plates under the door bearing the Alfa Romeo logo and the front and rear bumpers are color coded. Even the Alfa Romeo badge at the front is now surrounded with chrome. It's bound to turn heads. If only there was somebody around to have a look. Now the Italians certainly know a thing or two about designing cars and that's not only the exterior because the interior of this new Spider is just absolutely superb. There's a fantastic new control panel here in the centre which houses the automatic climate control that is now standard across the range. It's really smart, there's a chrome finish to the centre dials, it all looks really, really flash. So what's the price of all this Italian Exotica? Well, this one's a snip at just 80 pounds, but let's face it, you're not gonna get very far. On the other hand, the Spider, 23 and a half thousand pounds, is a really smart car. But the one that the big boys really want is the GTV. We'll be doing a program on this in the future, so watch out for it. As you can see, there's a whole range of colors to choose from, but me, well, I'm off inside for a wee dram. The Spider's hardtop sister car, the GTV, has now got a 3-litre V6 engine on the bonnet. And it's a shame Alfa Romeo couldn't fit the same engine into the Spider too, but it was considered not suitable for the UK market. However, both the Spider and the GTV get the same upgraded 2-litre twin spark engine, with some changes similar to the one fitted in the award-winning 156. The result is a more powerful and flexible engine pumping out 155 brake horsepower. The four-cylinder unit races to 60 miles per hour in 8.4 seconds, 
and now has a top speed of 131 miles an hour. Around town it will return around 21 miles per gallon and if you really can resist the temptation to put your foot down, it's claimed it can top 40 miles per gallon in the extra urban cycle. The reason why you need to get the pizza in to celebrate and why every Alfa Romeo Spider owner is celebrating is because of what they put under the bonnet. This revised two litre unit has got more power and it makes the Spider absolutely fly. It's fantastic fun. Well, that's just about it. Two breathtaking new cars from Alfa Romeo. And as we're here in Scotland, we thought it was only right that we should pipe this car in, in the traditional manner. Take it away, Alistair. Hi, I'm Nick Weir. And for some reason, I'm surrounded by Citroen 2 CVs. I wonder what's going on. Hi, what's the score? This is the 50th birthday party of the Citroen 2 CV at Walton on Thames. We're just off to Brooklyn's Museum. Do you want to come? That'd be great. You know, there's nothing quite like the sound of a race-tuned, throbbing mean machine. And this is nothing like it. Look, the back's the same as the front, look. <laughs> Wipe it down. There seems something incongruous about being at the home of British motorsport and the place where it really originated in the world, Brooklands, completely surrounded by motorised tin snails. But this is where the 2CV Club of Great Britain decided to come as part of their 50 year anniversary. And some of these machines are absolutely unbelievable. This motor car is a little bit special, isn't it? What's been done to it? Well, what they've done is they, they've done a, bought a Hoffman conversion kit, which is the back end, basically. And what they've done is they've chopped the roof off from the front sills here um, and basically put a fiberglass kit with like a Roadster-type boot on the back. I suppose when I bought this, I was after something a little bit special and mm. I came across a two-seater and said, I'll have some of that. Can this car uh, be seen cruising the streets of Weybridge regularly? I'm afraid it can't, no. Uh, we actually travelled down from Blair Athol in the highlands of Scotland, some 600 miles north of here. It took us three days to get here, but we got here. Roof down, wind in your hair. Absolutely. You know what that causes, don't you? Absolutely. <laughs> Patrick. Hello. Hi. How are you? Nice Hello. to meet you again. We've already met, but I just... So, this is a Citroen van. It is, yeah. It looks like more of a lifestyle than a mode of transportation. Do you want to tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, well, the van's basically um, an ex-butcher's van. It was used in France, um, and then it came into this country and was used as um, a chicken satay van. A guy was <laughs> taking it around festivals selling chicken satay and realised it wasn't big enough for him. 
Um, so uh, we bought it off him and we've sort of converted it into a camper. How long have you had it? We've only had it a couple of months, yeah, and uh, we've done all the sort of kitting out and putting the, the removable bed into it, so uh, um, yeah, it makes a good camper. It's very comfortable, isn't it? Yeah, it's like sort of a home from home, really, yeah. It's got quite a 60s feel about it. Is yeah, the drapes, just... yeah, yeah, it's all insulated as well, so it's nice and warm, so yeah. Uh, yeah. So what's the appeal, Patrick, of, of Citroens in the first place? I just think they've got much more character than, than other vehicles, you know, the styling of them, the appearance, uh, and there's something um, typically sort of French and rural about them, which mm. you don't get with other vehicles, yeah. It's like a, a 2 CV that collided with a shed, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's about as accurate as you exactly. can describe them, yeah. So what's the plans for the future? Anything coming up? Yeah, well, we, uh, the re main reason for getting this van is there's a, an international meeting of 2 CV friends in Greece next year, and hopefully we're going to drive this thing overland to Greece, but it's probably going to take a long time, because maximum speed is about 50 miles an hour, <laughs> so uh, it could be a long trip. How does it handle? I mean, do you... It's slow. There's no getting away from it. It's yeah. slow, but it's pretty comfortable. It's a good ride, yeah. yeah. Mm. All right, Pat, well, I'll leave you with the uh, banjo. Yeah, nice good. to meet you. Okay, yeah. I'll see you later on. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Meanwhile, not far away, this is bizarre. Here I am on the fame. It won't fall over, will it? Here I am on the famed banked circuit of Brooklyn's with three Citroën CVs and a Diane, and four of the nuttiest motorists I've ever met. And I've always wanted to say this. Gentlemen and lady, wait, wait for it. Switch it off, I'll tell you when. Gentlemen and lady, start your engine. Go! Talk about wacky races. All these people have come to Walton on Thames. It's just another part of the 50th anniversary of the Citroen 2CV. Another crazy thing, Citroen themselves didn't even want to know. You'd think that any other motoring manufacturer would be shouting the fact that people are still happy with their cars after 50 years from the rooftops. And these people don't just like their Citroen 2CVs, they're absolutely potty about them. Do you mind? Oh, sorry, mate. Well, I've spent the day with these people, and I've got to say they're very friendly, they've got a great sense of humour about their cars, but to tell you the truth, I'm not really convinced a 2CV is the car for me, but being six feet six and a bit of a showbiz lovey, if I was going to spend much time in a 2CV, this would be the one, complete with a chauffeur. I'll see you next time. Okay, driver, take me home. Ah, lovely, luxury. Even comes with a couple of kids. Right, I'm just removing the protective layer from this, from this aluminium sheet. And this is the bit that covers up the transmission tunnel. One, two, and this is the fourth bit. Okay, that's one done. It goes like that. These here are held on by screws, so you can get in and adjust the handbrake, which is there and the rest are riveted on using the silicon sealer as well. Making sure that we get that grommet in there for the wiring loom. Right, this bit is the scuttle. It's the bit that holds the windscreen in here and the wiper motors and uh, the heater goes in there. Now before we do all that lot, what I'm going to do is stick it on the car. We put these bits of tape on here so when we put the silicon sealant in there and it squeezes out, we protect the uh, glass from getting all smeared. Let's get it on, into position, and uh, get it sized up. We'll get it screwed in. Just lift this over the top and plonk it into position there. Now, 
we've got the uh, scuttle fitted to the car and we've also stuck all the ancillary stuff that goes on to it. Over there we've got the heater motor. In the middle is the airbox. And over this side we've got the expansion tank for the radiator. And then hidden right down here is the purge valve. You know that thing that empties the carbon can at the back that we discussed? Stuck in here. At last the thing's beginning to look like a car. We've got the windscreen on. We've got some mirrors. I think I'm going to have to stop posing in here and get some work done. I think I'll go and get the exhaust popped on. As you can see we've stuck the exhaust on, that's all now bolted up nice and firm. We've also put the ducted radiator in the nose cone, that's gone on. And I'm just going to go and trial fit the bonnet, see if it goes on. We'll try the boot box as well while we're here. There we go. It's all neat, tidy. Jobs are good, I think. There we go. That's got, th that's got that done. I'll bolt that up later. Let's just have a quick recap on what we've done on Module 5. We stuck the exhaust on, all the cooling systems in, fitted the bonnet, lo and behold, the windscreen's on and the mirrors. There are actually a few extra things that I've got to do for Module 5, but time's pressing on. Got to stick the headlights on and uh, the front indicators have got to do, go on. But what I'll do is I'll get to set to work, I'll do those, and then next time you come and see us, we'll have all that finished nice and neat. See you next time on Build a Car Right. <laughs>